Um, well, let's go ahead and get started. And I, I want to just jump straight in um, with Andrew's presentation. But then following that, we really want to just open it up to Q&A for all of you. Um, if you have the raise hand, you can use raise hand or use the chat. Um, Andrew, are you comfortable with people jumping in to ask questions as we go? Or would you like people to hold questions? No, feel free to jump in. Uh, I like as interactive as sessions as we can get. Um, especially where it all has to be virtual. Um, the more interactive, the better. Okay, perfect. And we have, it looks like a great representation from Cornell, from Purdue, as well as um, University of North Carolina, or State. Let's see, do we have Chris? Yes, Hi, Chris. I'm on. And that was you close are. to a... That was close to a major faux pas. But I know, sorry, <laughs> I caught myself. I'm like, whoop, <laughs> NC State. And uh, and then UIUC, Vikram. Yes. You know, uh, do you Shri have others from? Yeah, and Sri is here too. And I think oh, and I, I think here. as well. Great, and I know we have um, a number of students that are joining as well. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning or afternoon. Um, and we are very excited to have Andrew Nelson with us today. Andrew is a farmer and a computer scientist and has been using farm beats in his fields, which you can see here on this slide, for the last two and a half years. So um, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to hear about what he's done and how he's using it in practice. So Andrew, turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Elizabeth. So. I just wanted to give a quick overview of uh, why, you know, why I decided to, uh, well, and pursued the Farm Beats team to use on my farm and uh, just give you a quick background. So about eight years ago, I moved back from uh, the Seattle area to my farm and was looking at ways to utilize technology to help our farm be better. Um, I took a lot at the start. I took a lot of processes that my dad and my grandpa before him uh, did by hand, uh, you know, mostly record keeping, stuff like that, and made it digital. So I made a few apps, made, uh, you know, some spreadsheets to really reduce time on kind of just administrative busy work. And after I got a decent amount of that, um, you know, kind of taken care of and, um, and so that way I didn't have to focus as much time on busy work. I was looking at other ways to utilize technology to help our, our farm in the future. So what I, you know, looked around and uh, read some talks from Ramvir and or watched some that he gave and um, actually just by happenstance, <laughs> he was looking for a farmer to test out some stuff uh, this was about two and a half years ago, so him and I got in contact and I started using uh, farm beats on my farm. And I really try to use absolutely everything that is within farm beats and kind of prove it out on my farm and show where it can be valuable, what are some of the biggest, quickest wins that you can make on your farm utilizing technology. Um, and then some items I do, you know, are just kind of more research oriented um, to be able to further things along down the road. So some of those changes are, you know, I do a lot of drone mapping. I uh, now have a spray drone, so I use that on some of our fields. I utilize sparse sensor networks to be able to uh, better see what the climate's like throughout my whole farm, uh, which is quite different throughout all of it. And and then you kind of use the, the Farm Beats uh, research preview a lot and also the Farm Beats public preview. Um, use both of those sites to kind of tie it all together. Put the next slide here. So I was thinking that what I go over in in this talk is to go over the connectivity diagram that I have for our farm, how I have everything connected together. Um, farm Beats 
allows for so many different types of connections. I think that's really great to be able to go through them and see how somebody has their farm set up and how flexible um, it can be. Um, then I'll go into just some more practical things about station setup. Um, when I got the, the first weather stations to put out on my farm, um, I realized, you know, we it was like, well, yeah, we can just put it on a post, but that wasn't really going to achieve the result that I wanted because I wanted it, you know, in the field in a certain spot and I didn't want to have to take a post in and out. So it's always nice to, you know, think about some of those things that don't seem to be very important. They're not very techy, but yet they have a very big impact when you're using the tech. Um, so I'd like to go through station setup for that. Um, look at a precision map for sensor placement. Um, go over some microclimate predictions. Um, go over Visage, which is a uh, intelligent edge where I can uh, with one click, auto stitch, upload, and uh, view drone flight information. And then just kind of a, a little bucket of additional insights that I've kind of uh, thought of and ran across. And while we're going through the slides, if anyone has questions, I'm, you know, we may touch on some of those before we get there, but I just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose them. And this way it's in a PDF where you have the, um, the slides yourself so you can go through them later if you want. And then after that, we can go through some questions. So starting off with the connectivity diagram. Um, so I'm in my home office right now. This is where I do all of my edge processing. Um, after I do drone flights, I, I'll bring in the SD cards here I have a small, actually, Intel Nook uh, computer, but it doesn't have to be Intel Nook. It can be any type of computer. I just happen to load mine up with a bunch of RAM, so that way it can uh, do lost stitching. Um, I load up my drone images. I have my computer here that I can open up my, you know, different uh, pages for looking at the different uh, sensor stations. Um, and it's the place with the best uh, internet access. So um, best internet access doesn't mean that it's great. Um, during the weekday, I'll usually get about 10 to 15 down and about four megabits up, um, which is okay for living in the middle of nowhere, but uh, definitely leaves much to be desired. And then in the evenings, it'll usually slow down to anywhere from about six to eight uh, down at night. So, you know, it's, it's definitely something where I do have reliable internet out here, but it's still a big pain point for me uh, trying to get reliable internet and fast internet. So the Intelligent Edge just sits on my desktop um, I also have a LoRa sub edge here. Um, so some of my sensor stations connect up with LoRa um, and some of them connect up with TV white space. Uh, the ones right next to my house are just on LoRa. Um, it's, it was a easy to set up uh, way to get the first stations running. And, uh, but the problem is, is, you know, it only works about as far as I can see out of my office. So from my home office, I have a connection to my shop. Uh, right now, a little wireless connection. Um, and on the top of my shop, I have a TV white space antenna. So it's just a, a little diagonal antenna and a Yagi antenna, if you know what those are. I see there's a question. Clicking. Or are you just clicking the hands up for fun? <laughs> He's experimenting with the buttons. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know my 
uh, I have a Microsoft Surface Book. I'm looking to get a Surface Book 3. Uh, that's an advertisement for you. But in any case, um, I, you said the LoRa sub edge only works as far as you could see. Is that because it's line of sight and what type of distance do you get? Yeah, it's line of sight. Um, the furthest distance I've got is um, three quarters of a mile. You supposedly can get a mile, um, but then it you basically need to have your antenna outside and literally line of sight, not just line of sight through a window. Um, so my reliable connections are from half a mile um, and closer um, through a window in my house. I do have, I've had one on a non line of sight, but that was only at about 200 feet. So, so moving on, the, the TV white space connection is because I have non line of sight to a shed on the top of a hill about three miles away. So I'm kind of down in this hole where my shop and house is, and then the shed is over two hills away from me. But it's on a hill, so I can have, you know, higher antennas for connectivity. Um, I use TV white space because it is non line of sight, but it is a very strong connection um, to make from my shop to that to that shed. So there's about a, a 50 or 100 foot hill in between me and this shed, and it, it still connects up just fine. Um, and there's also some trees in the way too. So that is really nice and really made it a lot easier for me to do this. Otherwise, I would have had to make multiple hops um, if I were using some, you know, a Wi-Fi technology or or something like that to, to get internet over to this other location. Um, the shed has power, which is one of the other <laughs> Uh, big draws for me to place something over there. Um, I have land that's on higher hills, but there's no power. And the amount of, you know, solar power that I would need to uh, build and save, you know, energy for um, to run everything would, would get pretty, pretty expensive. So at that shed, I have a, another lower sub edge to have a weather station just right there at that shed. Um, I also, when I'm doing drone flights over there, I will um, connect into, I just have a little Wi-Fi set up at that shed. I'll connect into the Wi-Fi and stream the drone images back to my home uh, stitching computer. So that way I can fly the one field that's right there and start transferring those images back. And while I'm flying the other field on the other side of the road, I can start the stitching on the drone images. Um, and it just, it means one less field that I have to stitch when I get home. Um, you know, it, it stitches pretty fit, pretty quick, anywhere from three to 10 minutes, depending on the field size. And some of these field sizes are, you know, 300 plus acres, um, but it's still one less wait period that I have to go through. Uh, Andrew, could I interrupt with a quick question? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry to interrupt like this, but for some reason, hand raising isn't working, or at least I'm not getting feedback that it is. Um, no but, problem. Uh, I'm trying to get a sense of the geographic layout of these different locations relative to the fields. So you talked about a home office, a shop and a shed and the shed is three miles from the shop. Mm -hmm. Where are the fields exactly and uh, where is the shop relative to them versus the shed? So the shop is in a low area um, surrounded by hills. So I'm in the Palouse area of Washington State. So we have all these beautiful rolling hills that make it really hard for uh, <laughs> for wireless connectivity and um, so the shop is down and there's hills kind of all around it so it's blocked you know you can only see half a mile to a mile away in any direction around the shop mm -hmm. and then there's some hills between the shop and that shed that's on one of the higher hills mm -hmm. and 
And so if you were to go back to my, I'll just quickly go back, actually, it's a decent, if you go back to this slide, you see how there's all these rolling hills around. Imagine my shop is down here in this draw. Mm -hmm. And then this hill, well, I'd be a little further than that, but this hill over here where the where my neighbor's house is, um, that would be like where the shed is. So I have the TV white space set up pointed that direction, but there's a long hill in the middle and it's able to get the signal over that hill and to, to that shed to get connectivity. And is the shed the one that's closest to most of the fields or are, are they both surrounded? By so the fields? shed, they're both close to a lot of the fields. The shed's uh, main draw is that it's on a high enough hill where I can see line of sight to some fields that are eight miles away. And when you're getting past five miles line of sight with uh, TV white space, the IoT TV white space, um, you know, works much better when you have line of sight, especially at further distances. Okay. So that's why that's why I wanted to put it up at that shed, so that way it could uh, be able to see all the way to a lot more fields and cover a lot more area. Mm -hmm. Got it, thanks. If I put this IoT TV white space tower at my shop, I'm only going to be able to access 10% of my fields. Now with it at my shed, which is on a hill that's about 150 feet taller, and then my tower itself is uh, 25 feet. So that 175 feet is giving me access to about 80% of my ground versus that, you know, 10% of my ground. Okay. This is a pretty sophisticated setup, I should say. <laughs> we well, have to have for a while. Yeah. Well, it's exceptional. If you don't mind me interrupting, Andrew, I, um, I I don't know which of the, are you working with one of the Microsoft contractors, the subcontractors on the TV white space, or did you do this all yourself, or how did that work? So I work on the team. Um, benefit of being a software engineer. <laughs> Got it. So uh, that's kind of a nice thing is I'm able to test these things out. Um, I work on the team uh, testing them and I'm able to get kind of the real world value out of it pretty quickly um, since I know what I need as a farmer. Um, so that's that's kind of how it usually works. And then I, I work with the engineering team a lot um, if I have any questions or if we run into anything, um, sometimes we'll tweak what we're working on based off of, you know, oh, I'm trying to implement this, but, you know, here's a roadblock that I'm having. Andrew, um, this is Elizabeth. Did you install the TV white space towers yourself? Yes. How hard was that? You know, um, the actual tower, uh, which, I was hoping to get a picture yesterday, but uh, I wasn't able to. Um, the actual tower itself is just a, uh, a tower like you would have at your house to get um, over the air TV um, channels. So it's not that hard. It is putting it up um, 25 feet is difficult. Um, me and uh, somebody else who works on our farm, a high schooler, uh, it took all of our strength to get it up to that 25 foot height. Um, so I'm not going to say that was super easy, but, uh, but you know, it's any uh, tower that, that you're um, using for like receiving television station channels uh, works great for a TV white space tower as well. And the, the other thing is I was using, we were trying out this tower that costs $100. That was a lot cheaper. Actually, it was $100 ship. So it was like $80 um, if you happen to go and get it at Walmart. Um, so there are nicer towers um, that are much easier to set up. Uh, but you know the price goes up with the with the better ease of setup. Got it. So all of the all the things I try on are in this 
uh, setup that I have on our farm, I try to make sure that I'm uh, very price conscious. Uh, just like if, you know, as since I am a farmer, I know how tight margins are. And a lot of these things you can't be spending a lot of money on, especially if you want a bunch of sensor stations around your um, farm, you don't want to be spending, you know, a thousand dollars on every sensor station. Um, because that price adds up really fast. Um, so that I always try to look at the costs of, of everything involved to make sure that we aren't using something that isn't practical um, when using it in the real world. So, yeah, Andrew, this, is, this, is Vic, this is Vikram again. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you've uh, this, uh, uh, thought of any setups more focused on research goals rather than this kind of production farm setting. One of the things we're trying to decide is what set of sensors would be the most useful on a smaller field, but for experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you'll talk about that later, but if you do, it'll be uh, valuable to hear, that, hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think we can cover that later. Um, sure. I'd like to go through some uh, sensor setup. Uh, Sounds good. Slides and uh, but we let's definitely touch on that at sure. the end. Um, so last thing is, you know, the sensor station uh, four miles away, non line of sight is what I've been able to connect reliably at. Um, I did a test this last fall and I was able to get uh, 16 miles away line of sight um, with a reliable connection. That was with my tower placed on a, a taller hill. Um, and, uh, but that connection did work quite well. Um, so, you know, the, the higher you can get the tower, the better, I guess is uh, the moral of the story there. So the sensor station setup, I, I say I have two versions. I actually have three. The first one just didn't work. Um, my sensor station blew over the first night. <laughs> it was a little windy, but it shouldn't have blown over. Um, and uh, the materials did work well, but uh, but just didn't work well in, in reality. So um, my first version, I just used pressure treated wood um, connected to a uh, a stand made, you know, kind of out of scrap iron that I had around rebar, um, uh, solid inch tubing, um, on square tubing on the bottom, and then it's a three quarter inch uh, pipe that goes up the top. Um, you know, readily available at any hardware store too. I have access to a welder, so I welded it up. Um, it it does work quite well. It's pretty stable. I, as you can see in the picture, um, I do have, you know, blocks on the on the base. Just make sure it stays stable um, when we get really big wind gusts. Uh, I like that it is a little taller, um, but the problem with that is when doing field any field operation, uh, it has to be removed. And being that it's metal and then you have these heavy concrete blocks, when you're moving it for field operations, even if you know this were in a test plot and you're having to do you know field operations there, spraying the test plot or um, or anything in it, uh, the problem with that would be that we would we have to move it and it's very heavy, so I have to bring out my side by side, load it up, move it. Um, have to be careful when loading it up to, you know, not hurt the solar panel. And, and this is just very cumbersome. Um, the height does allow for better uh, radio communications. So when I place this one further, it works better with LoRa. But there's other ways to get around that. You can have an external antenna. Um, uh, you can get little uh, what they call pigtails to extend the antenna outside of the outside of the sensor box and that that ends up working pretty well. Um, I do really like having these on multiple parts of my field. 
um, or if I were to have dip, you know, or in different fields where I'm running um, trials of stuff. So as a farmer, I am always wanting to try the new thing, but I need to prove it out on my own fields. Um, just because a uh, acre trial says that some chemical or some uh, variety works well, um, that doesn't mean that it's going to work on my 320 acre field. So I like to make sure that I have a sensor station at every spot where I'm testing this out. So that way I also know what the weather was like. So if the field did exceptionally well, um, but it got you know two more inches of rain, which is very possible in my area. Um, there's a, right now there's a field that has three more inches of rain than any other of my fields, um, even though it's within 10 miles. Uh, so. I need to know that data to know, well, was it just that it got more rain or is it that, you know, this variety is actually that much better or, you know, the different practice I did in the field. So my favorite setup is this. Um, it doesn't look quite as pretty, but it's extremely functional, very cheap and very easy to make, um, which I think fits really well with uh, university research. Um, so the really nice part about it is you can go to any home building place and get the Schedule 80 PVC. Um, mine's rated for outdoor and it's still pretty cheap. Everything for my sensor or for, you know, the stands uh, costs $20. Uh, that includes all the elbows. Um, that doesn't include the sand, but sand's very cheap. <laughs> um, the nice thing about the two inch uh, conduit on the base is I cap off the base and I fill it with sand. So I have a nicely weighted stand. Um, this is a little shorter one because I like to keep it closer to crop. Um, but I have made taller ones and they're just as sturdy. Um, so this is really kind of my favorite design. Uh, this station was on the top of the hill um, this last winter when we got uh, 75 mile an hour winds during a, a winter windstorm and it did not budge. So, you know, it's, it's very hardy and I mean for that price, um, I just don't, I haven't seen a, a easier or better way to do it. Um, the other nice thing about it is it's actually quite easy to just pick up a move um, or just pick up and set because it has a way to base. You can set it in the back of a pickup, set it in the back of a side by side, move it out when you need to do field operations and move it back. And it's it's quite easy. Um, and if you need to, you know, take your station back to do repairs or, you know, add or remove sensors to it. Uh, it's just, it's not a big deal. You can screw right into the PVC. Um, this has, I, this is what most of my sensor stations are everywhere uh, because it has worked so well. Um, I do have one that I mounted on a, um, on a fence post that I drove in to the ground and I have to say, I, I, I am repurposing it for my orchard <laughs> right now because it was terrible. Um, I you have to you know move that fence when you're doing stuff. Um, this is very easy to place right on the same spot. Um, sometimes I'll just put a flag where it was so that way you know I make sure that the station stays at the exact same spot. Um, it's worked out really well. And then with the TV white space sensor. The only difference really is I just mount another metal plate to the top of it and put on the the CB antenna to uh, which is what I use for my antenna for TV white space uh, IOT. Um, I really like the the three foot CB antennas um, with the magnet base. They're really cheap. Uh, you can go to uh, any trucking store or any really any ag retailer, pick them up for five to ten dollars. And the three foot one seems to get uh, better results. I don't have hard data on it because I wasn't testing uh, side by side on the same day, but uh, 
but that the three foot one is what I was able to achieve those, you know, 12 plus mile connections, stable connections on and just seemed to work really well. Um, I see Stacy's question, how many sensor bases do I have over the whole farm? Uh, right now I have 10 um, and it is, you know, I'll probably keep it around that amount, uh, one per thousand acres, mostly because you have to, you know, periodically go and check on them, clean them, uh, set up everything. Uh, but I will have some fields where I do have multiple. So I'll have 10 locations and then one field I'll have three. So I'm able to do some different things in that field where I'm able to um, do the the AI prediction on soil moisture, for example. I need three sensor stations in the field to do that. Um, and that's why they work up really well. Um, and I, I need to move the station setup because, uh, for example, when I'm planting the field, I want to plant the whole field. I want the station to be in the crop. So I'll move it out of the way, plant the field, and then put it back. So that way my soil moisture sensor is in the same place as growing crop. Um, it seems to give me uh, better results and, and results more like what the reality is. Um, and if I'm spraying, you know, I usually, depending on what I'm spraying, I usually like to move them out of the way so I'm not spraying chemical over them as well. And uh, I do, I've tried doing machine data through TD Whitespace. Um, I had my combine connect up, connected up to it last year. Um, unfortunately, I was using the the bigger TV white space I have connected on my shop, the same one that I connect to that shed. Um, and I was connecting to that. The problem is my shop's too low. So I'd have to put in another uh, TV white space antenna up on that higher hill to be able to get wider coverage. Um, and right now the IoT TV white space is a very low bandwidth, low power. Um, uh, specification for just IoT devices. So really just for sensor stations sending low amounts of data. Um, it can't send enough data to be able to, you know, pull the data readout from my, you know, CAN bus or something like that. Uh, CAN bus is what I'm looking for. So the the IoT TV white space, they're both, they both use TV white space uh, frequencies. The IoT uh, uses this little card here, if anyone can see my screen. So this is the IoT TV white space card. So it's a very low power. I can run it on four battery, four AA batteries for over a week. Um, you can pick your frequency based off of which, uh, which plug you plug into, uh, frequency range. Um, and this streams, I think it's 128 kilobits a second at the max. Um, it is used for sensor stations and IoT devices um, getting connectivity on that very low power usage. Uh, the other one that I have is a large Yagi antenna that's about uh, four feet long. Um, it has a high powered uh, radio on it uh, to uh, use the more commercial TV white space uh, connection, which is used for, you know, serving broadband even to rural uh, internet users. Um, I would like to make a permanent station setup that uh, doesn't move around, but uh, the hardest part is, you know, I, I'm a minimum till person, so I still till. Um, if it were in a corner of a field, uh, that works. Uh, the hard part is uh, usually, you know, they're a little taller, and uh, one of my neighbors actually put a Davis one on one of his corner posts, 
you know, is sticking up a little bit so it could get the wind. Uh, the first year he had it there, he uh, hit it with his spray boom and uh, broke the $500 uh, weather station. So <laughs> that's why it's quite nice to be able to move it. So just a quick overview. Um, the kind of cool AI things that we're able to do using Sentinel data. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the sensor placement map on my, well, on my field. So using the past, uh, well, specified months of data, you can specify how long. Um, so I specified a uh, growing season from June until um, the end of July when I had a lot of uh, growing going on. It will look at the field using the NDWI images and determine spots on the field where you should place sensors to then be able to infer what the soil moisture is um, throughout the field. So that's what I did on this field. It's 100 acres. I placed three soil sensors um, throughout that field uh, based off of the sensor placement map. And I was able to see what the soil moisture is doing throughout the year. Um, and, you know, some of the things I'm using for that is being able to figure out, OK, for next year, what am I going to plan for my crops? Because it looks like I have a lot more available deep, you know, soil moisture in certain areas. And for this year, depending on what the weather has done, can I put a little more fertilizer on? Um, I saw a sub edge. How many do I use in total? Um, ideally, I'd use just like one uh, <laughs> or two. Uh, one to run TV white space, one to run Laura in my home office. Right now, I run uh, four of them. So one at my house, one at that shed, uh, one at a neighbor, at uh, somebody who borders one of my fields where um, I'm going to put a TV white space um, sensor station, but haven't got it out there yet. So I was able to use their internet and one at another further field away to do the same thing. Um, Thankfully, I know a lot of the people who live around our field, so I was able to just ask them and plug it in. It uses so little bandwidth that um, most everyone was fine with me plugging it in. So I already kind of touched on this the microclimate variability where we currently this spring have a field with you know, multiple inches more of rain uh, than our other ones. Um, and so if you see the little white lines on my map, that is where TV white space can connect from my one location with IoT for my sensor stations. So I can get a wide spread among our fields and be able to see where, uh, where weather has moved through. I'm also using that um, in addition to some of my neighbors are starting to use uh, some other weather stations on their fields that um, have publicly available information. The only problem is, is uh, some of them, I'm skeptical at how well they're keeping up the field. So that's why I'm not, or keeping up the weather station. So I don't quite know how reliable their data is. So it's, that's kind of why I still need to rely on my own data uh, because I'm not sure how their maintenance is on their weather stations or if there's any at all. Um, this better coverage does help a lot. Um, it helps a lot with field operations when we're really busy. Instead of saying, oh, should I move to this field? I can quickly pull it up on my phone and see what the soil moisture is like and say, oh yeah, the soil moisture is low enough. You know, it's 30%. Uh, I'll be able to do, you know, the planting that I was expecting to do there today. Um, it saves me about, you know, four hours from driving around to every field. Um, and that four hours, uh, especially in springtime, can make the difference, you know, in a month of getting planting done because sometimes if you don't get that four hours done you're delayed a week or two based off of rains and then you have to you know spray again later so 
hit or do your other field operation later. And that's where it's really helpful. Um, some of the WSU um, trials here are utilizing some of my weather station information. So that way they can kind of have the same thing because they have trials spread all throughout and they need to know which one they should go to first. Uh, you know, which one can they work on first? And instead of just going in the same order, they're, look, they're utilizing some of that same sort of information to be able to be more efficient at what they're doing. Um, the really cool thing, at least I think really cool, that we are able to do with these sparse sensor stations is to run microclimate forecasting on them. Um, able to use an AI model to uh, predict temperatures. Uh, it works really well for lows and high temperatures. Um, last year and this year, um, it saved me from spraying when it was going to get to below freezing. So looking at the weather forecast, I have five weather forecasts on my phone. Looking at all of them, uh, there has been multiple times where they showed that it was supposed to stay above freezing. And my microclimate prediction said that it was supposed to freeze and it did actually freeze um, in all the lower areas. And that's where I was gonna spray. And if I would have sprayed and it froze, that would have uh, impacted my yield anywhere from 10 to 50%, depending on how heavy of a freeze it is that night. So this is something that is very useful to me, uh, especially during spring operations, uh, making sure that I am protecting my crop, yet doing it when I can, but not, you know, just more information helping me make better decisions. So I'll quickly touch on the intelligent edge, um, which for me is a very handy device. Uh, it sits on you know, my computer in my office. Um, my bandwidth is limited, most in rural areas is. Um, and I'm able to take my small SD card. So just the SD card out of my drone. I'm able to plug it into my computer, run one command. And since I have my fields already mapped out in uh, farm beats. It's able to detect which field the flights were from, stitch them, and then slowly upload them without taking all my bandwidth. So the stitch images will stay on my computer. I can look at them immediately, and then eventually they will get to the cloud, and I'm able to look and get access to them anywhere then. Or I can run, uh, you know, additional AI on them in the cloud. Um, it is uh, getting some AI on my computer, um, you know, being able to do stitching algorithms and such. It is uh, very helpful for me to be able to do that and not kill my internet connection because there's been multiple times when I'm uh, stitching and uploading and also, you know, trying to log into my chemical supplier or some other website and uh, the old way doing it of transferring everything up to the cloud would have just trash my connection. I would have had no connection. Um, for example, yesterday I did uh, 500 acres worth of drone flights. Um, I wouldn't have been able to use my internet at all yesterday if I didn't have this. So I was able to do it. Um, I was able to see my stitched images and then I saw this morning when I got up everything was um, up to the cloud, even the full resolution images. So I wanted to quickly touch on a feedback loop example, um, and then uh, I'm going to try to go through these pretty quick so I have some time for questions. Uh, but I think this is really important to see, um, you know, the, the full loop of of the technology impacting what I'm doing in the field. So for this field, we had some grassy weeds. Um, it might be a little hard to see here. Uh, I tried to magnify it, but there's little grassy weeds in the middle of this picture. Um, I didn't have it over the whole field, just spots. And so I wanted to effectively spot spray it. So I was able to take a drone image. Uh, last year, what I did was I drew it out on my 
um, on my GPS information for my sprayer, for my ground sprayer, and drove around the field and sprayed it. Uh, the field that had the most grassy weeds was only 10% of the field. Most are less than 2% of the field. So usually I only have a few acres of every field um, that I'm having to spray. So this year what I ended up doing was I ended up buying a drone sprayer. So since I'm only doing a few acres in every field, this field had it down this little draw and then up a little bit to the left. I was able to uh, plug in the GPS coordinates of where the weeds were on my drone sprayer, have my drone sprayer spray it while my ground sprayer was doing other operations. And I was able to hit the, get the chemical on it more quickly. And also with the drone sprayer atomizes it better so it was able to get better coverage on those uh, grassy weeds, which in our area, Italian rye is very resistant and very tough to kill. Um, and this was actually able to take care of it. So um, worked out really well this year. Um, the Just reading the quick comments here. <laughs> um, Yeah, so I do look at them quickly um, with the raw view, but try to go from there. Um, I don't have NVWI um, or N NVI sensors on my drone, but I try to get them. Uh, a lot of the grasses and weeds I can see from the field with raw image, uh, trying to find more effective ways to, to be able to automatically um, parse those. I hope that was answering your question. Uh, my additional insights, uh, feel free to look at them in the PDF, but I'd, I'd rather have some more time for questions if people have questions. Andrew, do you want to go back to your insight slide? Sure. <laughs> okay, great. So, you know, the big thing is you really do need to think about field operations when doing any technology on uh, using any technology on, on the farm. Um, and I think that a lot of people forget about that because um, you still have to farm. Um, <laughs> uh, routine check of stations is also very important um, because you don't want to have junk data coming in. Um, the TV white space tower uh, is nice to have it easily accessible. Um, if you, I had I had an issue where a uh, a rodent climbed up the tower and ate my my antenna. Um, the way I had it built the first time, or ate the antenna cable, it was very difficult to access. So that that made it a big issue. Um, those heavy duty truck CV antennas are great for TV white space. Um, very resilient and very cheap, which is why I like them. And the weighted weather stations, uh, I can't stress that enough, uh, help so much. And it is, and it is once again, really nice to be able to move it if you need to. And if you have trials in a different spot, that way the next year you can move your station set up from one field to another. Andrew, as um, questions come in on chat, could you read them just in case yeah, I'm on the sure. phone? Okay. okay, awesome, thank you. <laughs> so I, I have one question here. What are some thoughts from your neighbors about the technology? Have they thought about Farm Beats adoption themselves, especially since they're losing $500 weather stations and Farm Beats is supposed to be low cost? Um, yeah, I, you know, I've had some talk with me about it. Um, some are a little scared off by the amount of uh, setup involved. Um, and to be honest, Farm Beats is more meant for researchers and companies to build on top of, not for the end farmer consumer. Um, it's not that a farmer couldn't do it, it's just that it's not really built that way. It's more built for um, a chemical company or, or another value add company to add insights on top of. Um, but a lot have talked to me about it. Um, 
they really like the idea of cheaper weather stations and pretty much all of us agree that having a thousand dollar weather station or two thousand dollar weather station in your field just does not make sense um <laughs> because you know to have too many of them uh to have enough of them to help and the amount of accuracy that you get for that additional price uh doesn't currently make a big enough difference in uh, the data that you're able to get, you know, versus the no data that you have now. So I see Dennis's question. As we want to make the dollar case for IoT and ag, can you point to top one or few key decisions and related actions that you use to justify your tech? So I'm pretty pragmatic. I just by my tech by making sure that it can pay for itself. So for example, when I bought my drone last year, um, I thought of a way where um, I could reduce my grassy herbicide spray by 90%. Um, that paid for, I could have bought 10 drones. Um, but I look at those first quick gains to get technology in the door, and then it's more incremental gains off of that. So. Um, made that really great ROI last year, um, which is literally why we had a profit on my farm. Um, that it, the amount that I saved was almost equal to my profit. Um, and this year, uh, that's why I ended up getting the drone spare. It's not saving me as much, but it's still saving me um, and should be a return on investment within a year. Um, for the sensor stations, those ones are harder to figure out the return on investment, but they are very valuable when you look at your neighbors and how much more effective you're able to be. So I'm able to keep spraying, keep doing field operations, usually a couple days uh, every season when they are sitting because they didn't you know, drive to every single field and check it. And I'm able to check it on my phone and say, oh, we can just move to this field and keep going. Uh, Elizabeth had a question. What are you most looking forward to being able to do in two to three years from now using tech on my farm? Uh, more of these feedback, feedback loops, definitely. So um, I hope I have another few drone sprayers actually within that time frame. So I'm able to do a feedback loop on that um, and be much more precise at every chemical I'm putting on my field. Um, I'm also hoping that I'll be able to um, have some better AI insights on my fields and start breaking down the chunks of my field that I am managing from, you know, field wide. I'm now down to subfield, but I'd like to be down to acre within two to three years and sub acre after that. I think that the kind of micromanagement of your field is very important. Uh, soil and everything is so different throughout fields that um, it's not all just the same. Uh, and you're welcome, Dennis. <laughs> uh, it looks like I know you just have like a minute left. It looks like a couple last questions coming in. Yeah. So what are what versions of the sensor boxes am I using? I'm using version two. Um, version three is a little easier to connect the TV white space to than version two. Um, so that's the main difference. Um, the bandwidth with TV white space for the commercial version that I'm uh, running over to the shed, uh, that's a high bandwidth. I do about uh, 12 to 16 megabits per second with that. With the IoT, it's in the 128 kilobits. Um, is it fair to say that with less field stations and tech in general, then you have less accuracy? So it comes down to decision making, understanding the trade offs, cost, performance, reliability. Um, yeah, yeah, you, it's a balance of how many stations do I want for better accuracy versus how much. Um, you know, money do I want to invest in placing sensor stations around? It's definitely kind of a, uh, you need to find the balance point. Any specific sensors I would like to add? 
Um, we have some CO2 sensors that I'm collecting data on, but I'd like to figure out ways to utilize that data better. Um, I, I really would like to have a real-time NPK probe. Um, so that way I could see uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium in my soil um, and know how uh, the crop is using it. Um, what bottleneck is today in analyzing images down to the per acre levels? Um, yeah, Vikram, we can definitely take it offline. Uh, the this edge has really helped Visage, sorry, to uh, take away a lot of bottlenecks. Uh, there's still some in the pipeline for running AI on it uh, that we're looking to solve uh, to make it much easier. Um, to analyze images, but then also make it so I can use it in our platform. Thank you, Chris. So, I really appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> I think this was fantastic. Thanks, Andrew, everyone. thank you so much. I think we have to uh, stop. We're at time, but we'll put a copy of this meeting and the slides and maybe some of these uh, additional questions up on the team site. And we'll send out an email just to make sure everyone can access the team site going forward. So thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Great presentation. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Feel free to send emails if you have questions. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll uh, see you again next time. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Thanks, Elizabeth. This is great.